Can we achieve food security and biointegrity without using pesticides? Let's have a look at the problem. Let's talk about ants. Specifically, let's talk about ant invasions. These invasions are happening more often, more widely, and having growing impacts. Ants can have all kinds of impacts. Interestingly, in fact, fascinatingly, ants are attracted to electrical circuits. They go there and die, and they attract more ants. This can have all kinds of strange effects, but in Arkansas, for example, farmers can spend up to $1,500 a year combating the fire ants to keep their irrigation systems running. Ants can have impacts on wildlife and farm animals also. In Texas, for example, they saw a 90% reduction in water bird offspring in the natural habitat when they didn't treat it for the ant infestations with the fire ants. Ants can have impacts on people also. They burrow out underneath roads and pathways, causing them to collapse at huge cost. In Brisbane, Australia, they had this headline earlier this year, Fire Ants Infiltrate Park. But actually, this is a place with a 15-year history of headlines like this. Playground stuck by fire ant plague and disaster alert as ants cut a path of destruction. In California, the Argentine ants take the water from the trees by farming the mealybugs. And so they're harvesting the nutrients and the water, which can affect the individual trees, but also whole orchards are at risk from this, particularly in a drought. In New Caledonia, a Pacific Island country to the north of New Zealand, they had a coffee industry with the villagers farming the coffee crop, but the little fire ants stung the people so much that they had to abandon the crop and lose the chance for revenue at the village. And remember, this is coffee we're talking about here. Governments are mounting responses to these incursions. <laughs> Actually, they are. And we're seeing, for example, in our global eradication database, close to 1,000 programs from 100 countries where they're mounting responses to try and combat these invasions that are happening more and more because of globalization. Pesticides, that's the answer. That's what people are doing in response to this. So pesticides can also have all kinds of impacts. Perhaps you remember DDT, the persistent pesticide that came back to bite us, affecting birds and other wildlife. But one of the major groups of pesticides today are the neonicotinoids, which are implicated in honeybee deaths in Europe, for example. So pesticides can persist in the environment and cause unexpected impacts later. They end up in the food chain all too easily. So sometimes it's hard to know what's worse, the pesticides or the ants. Is there anything that we can do about this? Can we achieve food security and biointegrity without pesticides? Well, yes, we can. And to illustrate this, move off the ants for a moment and look at what we did with a pesticide-resistant moth. So the orchardist had been spraying insecticides and the insect was out of control in his orchard. The height of the bars indicates the catch of the moths. So here he is spraying regularly, putting pesticides on our food, and still not gaining control of the pest. He still has the problem. So we decided to try something different. We applied the moth's own sex pheromone into the orchard once a year in small plastic devices that release the smell. So we're disrupting the moths, stopping them from mating. No more mating, no more babies, no more moths in the next generation, and the pesticide resistance problem was resolved. So how does this work? Imagine a blindfolded man is looking for his wife <laughs> in a room by her perfume. <laughs> He'll probably be able to smell his wife and find her. But what would happen if the same perfume smell 
is in the air everywhere, what would happen? Well, he probably would wander around aimlessly forever and never find his, his wife, right? That's what happens to the moths. Remember, I'm not talking about a poison that kills anything. I'm talking about a smell. And it's just a smell that stops the moths from having their mating behavior, and it protects our apples. So today, New Zealand apple orchardists can control four moth species with one pheromone device. It's not adding any residues to the fruit. It's not putting any pesticides in the environment. And our apple orchardists are using our research and exporting the best apples to 70 countries. Exporting and sharing our apples with people in 70 countries. A great success. So it's kind of sad for the moths that don't get to have sex in the orchard. <laughs> Sorry about that. But all's fair in this game. Let's go back to the ants. The success that we had with the moths caused us to think again about how we're dealing with the invasive ants. Let me explain something about the ant behavior. The ants form a trail, and one ant lays the trail, and then the other ants can follow that to find the food. And this is how they work together to harvest resources. And they have a smell organ on their antennae. So these tiny, tiny hairs on the, the insect's antenna fire special nerves when they smell the pheromone. And so they're able to detect where the, where the pheromone has been laid, and they can, they can follow it through. And that's how they find resources like your lunch. So the ants are zigzagging. And I actually make movies of the ants walking, right? It's more interesting than you might think. You'll see in a minute. <laughs> so the ants are zigzagging into the clean air and turning back over the trail, into clean air on the other side, zigzagging back and forth, and that's how they do it. And we've known that since the 1960s, the work of, of Hangardner. And you can see that in this digitized track that's quite close up there. This is how the ants are actually doing it. So we're watching ants trailing on the wall, but it's a little bit like watching paint dry. But watch what happens when I put a vial of the pheromone next to the trail. Suddenly, something has changed. The ants rely on pheromones, and now we've given them an oversupply of their own information channel. The first thing that happens is that the ants are following the straight line. And then when we introduce the pheromone next to the trail, it completely disrupts their behavior. And so they're going from a very high level of trail following to no trail following at all, within seconds. OK, the second thing that happens is we move from being on the left there with the zigzagging. So as the ants approach the area where the pheromone is applied, suddenly they waggle wider and wider. And that's because they are crossing the plume, but because the pheromone is diffusing, the pheromone-laden air finds itself where they are, and they can't tell where the clean air is anymore, and so they can't know when to turn. And so, eventually, they end up walking in circles, which, unfortunately, I was unable to show you just then. But the third thing that happens is that the ants are building up in the movie frame. They're coming from the nest side, and they're coming from the food, and they're meeting in the middle, and they're unable to get home again because the trails have been disrupted. So the ants are milling around in the middle, and they can't leave. So we go from order to chaos. And the question then is, will this work in the real world? So we've done trials on the big island of Hawaii in Volcanoes National Park, and we've done trials here in vineyards in New Zealand as well. And we're finding that the trail following goes down 90% out in the field. Another measure that we can use is the forager bait visits. We put out baits and we see whether the ants can find them and whether they can communicate that back to the nest, and they cannot. A 90% reduction there also, it's a good sign. Back in the nest, we've got the ant fat body dropping by 30%. So it's having an impact back at the nest as well. So perhaps in the future, we'll be able to listen to the conversations of nature and develop tools and techniques for controlling insects like these 
without the need for pesticides, thus securing a green future. So I'd like to thank my group and also colleagues like Bob Peck at the uh, US Geological Survey in the Big Island of Hawaii, and Phil Lester and Fabian Westerman at Victoria University, and colleagues Jim Walker and Vaughan Bell in, in Hawke's Bay. Thank you very much.